Can we find the answer to why things die in looking at the way a machine works? It's all these parts, and every part is here for something. Every part does something, and we get why every part is there. It's all there because it's a mechanism to create something like a quilt. Every nuance of it is there to serve that purpose. Life is a machine. Life is a machine that's designed to create eternal happiness for conscious beings, or that's Swedenborg's assertion anyway. And you think about the cloth. The cloth that comes out of it is these people that keep expanding and being more fulfilled forever. And you can see why some of these levers and gears and stuff are there. You can see the stuff that promotes growth and the chance for upgrading your ability to experience joy. But this one, death, the cessation of existence on one plane, this abrupt splitting of things, why is it here? What does it do? How is death a part of weaving this cloth? So are you, are you gonna buy this sewing machine? It just makes you wonder, can any good ever come out of death? How could death possibly be a tool in spiritual development? And could it possibly be part of a divine plan? I mean, even Jesus died, right? I guess so. Do you want to see another model? And was it always meant to be like this? Did God want death to be a part of things? This isn't really the kind of stuff we went over in my employee training. So. Yeah, but I know, isn't, but isn't this the stuff that we should be learning about in life? And actually, it is the stuff we're going to learn about tonight. Hey everybody, welcome to Swedenborg and Life. Today we're gonna to be looking at death. Why is it here and is there any way something good could come out of it? My name is Curtis Childs and I'll be your host. With me as always, the mighty Dr. Jonathan Rose. Thanks so much for hanging out. Hey Curtis, it's always a blessing to be with you, but I have to say the topic is, uh, I'm a little squeamish about it. I mean, are we saying, oh death, it's so great. It's, you know, it's sort of a messed up topic, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it does kind of look a little morbid just having the word death on the screen right there. But what I'm hoping is that we can get rid of some of those connotations mm. by asserting that we're not saying that death is no big deal. Or we're not saying that death isn't painful or anything like that. So what would you say we're saying? What we're saying is that with a state of reality as it currently is, a system that includes death is the best tool for creating a heaven from the human race. Mm. That's a beautiful thought. It's not exactly something sort of self-evident, like we can quit now that we said that. Well, what do you mean? I mean? Well, within the bubble of reality, like let's say this is the bubble of what we can sense and everything that we know, the universe as we okay. experience like everyday it. life. Right. Death does not seem to reflect a divine heart and mind running the universe. Yeah, you're right, because it, it seems so cruel and random. The, the bonds of love that we can have for each other are so deep and they're so real, but that those bonds can be just broken by something as arbitrary as a physical machine that, that's our mm. body shutting down and not getting what it needs. Yeah, painful and tragic. So to, the only way to balance that equation is that you have to go outside of that bubble to say, oh no, there, there's more that we don't experience and that's what we need to look at. Yeah, so you what's know? out there? Something about the nature of life after death or God or something needs to correct this. And if death is, like we're saying, a part of this machine of life in some kind of positive way, what are the facets of it that allow it to play a useful part like that? Mm. Yeah, and we speak about death and we think about human death, but of course that's just part of this whole cycle of life and death that everything experiences that's alive. We're talking about pretty much all life on the planet goes through it. There are all kinds of organisms with amazingly long lifespans, and in some extreme cases, we're not totally sure, can they live indefinitely, but that's just the fringe stuff. Only living for a relatively fixed period of time is certainly the normal way that things are done across all of biology. So why? I mean, we think that things just die because, you know, they can't last forever, they get old, but if you're God and you're starting from a blank slate, I mean, how do we get here? Yes, and what's the point of us not continuing to go from this world to the next with our whole selves? Why pull out of one level and go to another and leave this body behind? Right. And was death designed to be this abrasive and heartbreaking? Yeah, well, okay, but an interesting indicator that God sees value in this process somehow is that he did it. 
Aren't、mm. you curious why Jesus died?、Mm. Or why is God participating in this cycle? Why wasn't it well? You can you know you can beat me down, but I'll never die. Why did he like die and then come right back to life? And where do we even start with all this? Yeah, I, I think we should start here. I mean, in the physical,、mm. easily observable world. And how about in the best part of that world? I need to go get some coffee. So what we're trying to assert in this show is that death is actually a good part of the divine design,、mm. but that seems really counterintuitive because、mm-hmm. death, as we know it, is abrasive and painful, and just doesn't seem like it's helpful. So I, I, what I wanted to ask, first of all, is: Is there anywhere in life that we know of where death is actually helping? Yeah, you don't have to go further than your own physical body because death is actually a critical part of our physical health. What?、Wow. Yeah. So there's this mechanism that goes on all the time、um, in our bodies that's called programmed cell death, and the technical term for it is apoptosis. What's that doing? So apoptosis, when your body uses this mechanism, what's there's a special class of enzymes called proteases. Trypsin is one of them, and when they get activated, it causes this process to happen where Um, eventually, proteins get degraded and it kills off cells. And so, different cells in our body might have different lifespans depending on the organ.、Um, but、uh, in all cases, this mechanism is used to actually help the overall health of the organ. And so, we get the experience of just being alive. You know, I woke up, I'll、right. go to sleep tonight. And but. What's making that possible is this ongoing cycle of death and rebirth that's happening at a cellular level. Well, and the, and it's on purpose that、yeah. you'd think cells would just try to live as long as they possibly could, but these cells are saying, nope, it's my time to go because this is what helps the the whole. Yeah. So, for example, in our stomachs, there's this really harsh environment with hydrochloric acid that helps our digestion. But so those cells of the lining of our stomach, they get renewed every few days, and. You know they need to do that, or else we wouldn't have a healthy digestive system. And so,、uh, whatever the cell is,、um, on whatever whatever level, our this death of cells is really supporting our ongoing health and longevity. That's and it's so amazing that that's how it works. And you can even take that beyond just the level of a single organism. You think about species, like this is a, a finch, which is this classic symbol of adaptation and evolution. Yeah, right. And and we've noticed that that finches can be different on different islands, but also even they're still changing because、uh, there's finches that are adapted to urban environments now. They're noticing they have like a wider beak to get into bird feeders better. And and that so that kind of A change though couldn't happen without death,、yeah. because it's the, the 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 generations and how each in each generation the ones that are the best adapted are the ones that survive that make this kind of change possible. Because an individual finch can't change, so if they live for for a million years, you wouldn't get them as well adapted as they are. Yeah, and you're making me think of just like on another scale, you have whole ecosystems where death is this critical element involved, right? Yeah, absolutely. You think about forests. If if none of them ever died. It would just be these same trees that were here 20 million years ago because they're the biggest. They got all the sunlight. But as soon as one of those things falls over and dies, then suddenly you've got disruption, and there's light coming in, so these little ground-dwelling plants can grow up, and new species of trees got a chance to get in there. So, in this funny way, death is what allows for this huge diversity of life. Yeah. So in all of these physical examples, there's really there's got to be some kind of correspondence going on, right? And so、yeah. there's got to be. Insights we can glean from this to help us see how death is really a useful part of our spiritual lives too. Oh, I love it, and that—that's、yeah. our starting point. I think that's where we can start to look at. So, death helps on the physical level.、Yeah. How does it also help on the spiritual level and beyond? So, both of these physical examples of death that we just looked at—the program cell death and then individual members of a species passing on—they're both adaptations for what's next in the process. There's this universal pattern of having something for a while and then having to let it go. It's kind of like a spaceship with rocket boosters. It's got to get out of the atmosphere, but then it's got to shed those things because they're not useful anymore and, and they're too heavy. And Swedenborg says that it works like this spiritually as well. It is by divine providence that we divest ourselves of what is physical and time-bound by dying. And put on what is spiritual and eternal. The physical and time-bound things are the outermost and final substances that we first enter when we are born, in order eventually to be brought into deeper and higher things. So this implies that because of the nature of deeper and higher things, you couldn't just start with them. You got to start on a static physical foundation and then work your way up. 
The outermost and final things are what hold us together, and they are found in this physical world. This is why no angel or spirit has been created as such directly. Rather, all of them first came about by being born human. As a result, they all have outermost and final substances, essentially stable and constant, within which and by which their more inward substances can be held together. It kind of seems like we're a mold. You have to have this stable physical structure for the living stuff to fill in. Further, all the deeper and higher parts of us are present at once in these outermost or final elements. As a result, everything the Lord does, He does from beginnings and endings at once, and therefore completely. However, the outermost and final substances of the material world cannot accept the spiritual and eternal things for which the human mind is formed, not as they are in essence, even though we are born to become spiritual and to live to eternity. We therefore divest ourselves of them and keep only the inner substances of the material world that are adapted and congenial to what is spiritual and heavenly. These serve to hold us together. We do this by casting off the limiting time-bound physical substances, a process that we call physical death. So did you, did you catch that last part? It seems like he is saying that something physical, some really specialized part of it, does stay with us, even in the spirit, which is crazy, and also just shows more why you'd need to have this physical foundation in the first place. So we've seen that death can actually play a useful role physically, mm. and we've illustrated why we need to start out in a more static and fixed layer of reality like this one, and then graduate from it. Yes, and those are two visible examples of how death is key. But even within us, there's a miniature version of this death that happens. So what's that? What, what in us do we need to leave behind? Well, briefly put, our self-centeredness. Yeah, which is, like the body, useful for a little while. When you're a kid, you need to be all about yourself, but eventually we need to move past that. Yeah, in the long run, it gets in the way of heaven forming what needs to be formed in our minds and hearts. This is from the Doctrine of Life 93. Since this self-centeredness is the taproot of the life we lead, we can see what kind of trees we would be if this root were not pulled up and a new root planted. We would be rotten trees that need to be cut down and thrown into the fire. This root is not removed and a new one put in its place unless we see that the evils that constitute it are harmful to our souls, and therefore we want to banish them. However, since they are a part of our self-centeredness and therefore give us pleasure, like, oh, we like this, we can do this only reluctantly and in the face of opposition, and therefore by doing battle. Hmm. And who wants to be a rotten tree? Nah, man, but it takes a while to get there. Luckily, this mm -hmm. can be a very gradual process that we can illustrate, you know, through the story of the apple. Everybody starts out life with a will that's composed of what's called hereditary self-centeredness. So we just have a natural tendency to put ourselves ahead of everyone else and our wants and needs ahead of everyone else's wants and needs. And this self-centered life is okay, it's natural, but we gotta move on from it. And it spawns what we could call the first rationality in us, or how our mind is before rebirth, kind of like a fruit hanging off this tree of self-centeredness. The fact is that when we're born, we are not rational beings yet. That's something that develops over time. And the only motivation we've got to get into that condition is this self-centeredness. And so we use that. It's harnessing our sensory experience. It looks at various different types of things that we're taught. We go through school. We're learning secular studies. We're learning how to reason, how to present an argument, and so on. And there are various issues that we see around us in the news and things that we learn from religious teachings and so on that go to assemble this rationality. It's a rationality, but it has no spirituality in it yet. And it's just been motivated by self -centered. Uh, factors in order to be a person in this world. It has the potential within it, though, for a heavenly rationality, and that's forming inside, almost unbeknownst to us, in the form of these seeds. But if it never detaches from the branch, so to speak, from that self-centeredness, those seeds have no hope. They can't grow. But just like 
an apple, it does detach. Well, if we're willing to start to undergo this spiritual growth and the apple falls down, hits the ground, and just like real apples do, decays away. So this first rationality gradually moves off, but those seeds in there that were fed by this old life that kind of took the best out of them, they then can start to grow into what's called our second rationality, which is a gift from God, and the second rationality is awesome. It's full of stuff like wanting to serve God and the neighbor, understanding how to be loving and useful, and to see that all truth and goodness comes from God, these higher weapons grade spiritual truths. So it's not a bad tree to have growing in the mind. We talk more about the two levels of rationality in our show, Why Are Spiritual Things Hard to Believe? And as we gradually let this old focus, our old lifestyle die, these elements that used to cling to us can kind of be put out in the trash. Right, it's like getting rid of useless clutter to allow new room. But the burning question is how do we do that? Oh, well, allow me to explain. So remember we talked before about apoptosis earlier in the show. Sometimes there are certain cells in the body that need to die and move aside so that we can move forward in health and in integrity. So here we're talking about spiritual apoptosis because there's self-centeredness, there's materialism, and that stuff has got to go because our spirit needs to move beyond that. But how do you catalyze that process on a spiritual level? We did a whole show about temptation. This is a process that is translated in a number of different ways, but essentially it is the process by which we catalyze this spiritual apoptosis. Swedenborg talks about it in the Doctrine of Life 94. The only way to dig out the root of evil is to do battle against it. The more we do battle and thereby set evils to one side, the more what is good replaces them and we look at what is evil in the face from the perspective of what is good and see that the evil is hellish and hideous. Since this is how we see it then, we not only abstain from it, but develop an aversion to it and eventually loathe it. Because if, you're, if it's working for you, you don't necessarily see the harm that it does. So when we're in this lower ego mode, it's really hard to tell who's the good guys and who's the bad guys. And if we're tr gonna try to get past it, we've gotta use some of the most potent spiritual tools available to the human race, which of course are video games. <laughs> Okay, here I go, logged into the game. Here I come, I'm coming in on the right hand side of the screen there. All right, we got ourselves a board here. There's a river in there, a couple of points of access, and looks like there are two creatures here as well. And initially they look like they're both allies. They stand for defending what's right. But with my own sight, I can't be totally sure what they actually are. I think I better acquire a tool to make sure. I think I see just the power up I need down there and to the left, so I'm gonna go check it out. Nice, divine truth from God. And now I can see, whoa, one of these really is an ally, but the other was a negative agenda in disguise. That's just gonna bring a lot of strife into my life. I better get rid of it. All right, here goes maximum blaster power. Huh, nothing. Just not strong enough. From my own power, I can't get rid of it. I can't help justifying it somewhere inside me. So I'm gonna need some superpower. Wait, what's that promising looking cone of light in the top right? I'm headed over. So I have to invite in this divine love power. I've gotta cultivate a real desire in my heart to change and humility that I need God's help to change. So with that powered up, let's try this again. With the power of divine love, I'm gonna push away this state of mind. And now I better go partner up with and collect this state of mind that I do want. So let me just go across this bridge here. All right, I beat that level, on to the next one. Oh, similar situation here. We've got another two characters, and again, I can't tell what's really going on with them. So I gotta power up. Yep, just like I suspected, one was not what it claimed to be. Gotta go, go to my source of power. And now, let's apply it, let's clean up the mind. And go over and make the connections with the things I really should be connected with. So this is the game of spiritual growth. This is a process of gradually realizing that some of the thoughts and feelings we've considered our friends are really our enemies. And then being willing to push them away with God's help. 
It's a lot to do, but you don't gotta get it all done at once. This is a lifelong process, and sometimes it can be difficult if we're really entrenched, if we've really been loving these negative things and making them a part of our life. But if we haven't been so involved, it could just be you make a couple good moves a month and you will make progress. It's really about just choosing as much as we can to respond to daily situations in more and more heavenly ways. It's really something to think about that process. And it strikes me that letting old agendas die is probably what Jesus was talking about when he said, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Yeah, I was wondering what he was talking about. That's gotta be the same subject as those who try to save their own life will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. Mm. Right? And doing the inner battle you were talking about is what Jesus must mean by this statement in Luke, that if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So would you say there's a parallel between what we go through with what Jesus went through? I think there definitely is a parallel, but there's one significant difference that Swedenborg talks about in the Lord, section 33. This is how we become spiritual individuals by means of our trials or battles against our evils. How we therefore become angels. The Lord though, fought against all the hells with his own power and completely tamed and subdued them. And by doing so, since at the same time he glorified his human nature, he keeps them tamed and subdued to eternity. I can just tell we're getting this close. We're about to be where we can finally explain why did Jesus participate in the death process. Can you take us there? Mm, let's go there now. So what about Jesus and his life and death? You're God, you're sitting up in heaven, everything's great. Why would you be born in this troubled world and then why, if you were born in this world, would you want to die? What do you gain by that? Why not just stay in the world and be powerful? What does it tell us about the nature of death? Well, one thing is that death is transformative. Paul says this in his first epistle to the Corinthians. He speaks of the resurrection of the dead and said, the body is sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So Paul's saying that this time of death is a time of transition from weakness and so on into this greater power. And it was especially transformative for Jesus to go through this. You see this in the New Testament account because first of all, he's just walking around normal human being. He's teaching, he's healing and so on, but he just occupies one physical space. After he's resurrected though, oh, he's appearing behind locked doors. He's disappearing. He shows up with these people over here. Oh, now he shows up over there and he's changed in some way. People don't recognize them and so on. He came down into this world to bring that divine power down to the outermost level. This is what Swedenborg says in his work on the Lord, which I recommend to you, section 36. While from the beginning God was human on the first or innermost level, he was not yet human on the last or outermost level. After he took on a human nature in the world though, he also became human on the last or outermost level. The Lord united his human nature with his divine nature and in this way made his human nature divine as well. So this was one reason why he wanted to come all the way down into this world of limitation and everything, what you see imaged here, uh, but also bring with him that divine, which is represented on the other side there, so that by being at both levels, he could be present with all different states, all different conditions that we go through in between those two. This is why he said to John on the Isle of Patmos when he was in his resurrected state, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And at the beginning of the book of Revelation, he says, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead and see, I'm alive forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and of Hades or hell. So the Lord was gaining this power over hell through going through this process. And part of what happened when he was going through this was that when he was in this outward state, 
of being just in a worldly perspective, the divine seemed absent to him. He's praying to the divine. He's going through suffering. You can't get the divine itself to suffer. It, it, just, it just won't do it. And so he was going through this emptying out. Swedenborg says this about it. It was by means of his trials and the subsequent victories and by means of his suffering on the cross, which was the final trial, that he completely subdued the hells and completely glorified his human nature. So that's what he was doing here. And once the hells were dealt with, then the main thing was to fully glorify that human nature, which was making it one with what was divine. Here's further in the Lord number 35. Because the Lord's human nature was glorified, that is made divine, on the third day after his death, he rose again with his whole body, which is not true of any human being, since we rise again with our spirit only and not with our physical body. No one has ascended to heaven, we read in scripture, except the one who came down from heaven. Every one of us who is saved ascends to heaven, though not on our own, but rather through the Lord's power. Only the Lord ascended on his own. So part of what the Lord was doing was not only going through this process of coming down, but then bringing that up and making himself available on all levels, but he actually became the process. And so when we go through the process of living in this world and dying, even if we don't know his name or who he is, he is able to be intimately present with us and help us through every step of it. And this takes away the sting of death. Paul says again to the Corinthians, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So that's how Jesus fits in. Death is transformative and Jesus is ensuring that whenever it happens, it's always somehow contributing to our spiritual growth. But that's like the patch, I mean, the update to make sure death behaves, but was it always this agonizing going through death? Was the human race always meant to have to deal with death like this? Well, it might not have always been the case. And there's actually some insight into that in the text of the Bible. The Bible is a symbolic story of the progression of humanity. If we go to the very beginning, we see the story of Adam and Eve in the beautiful Garden of Eden. That's a symbol for the beautiful, pristine state of mind that humans were in in the beginning. The Golden Age, or what Swedenborg called the earliest church. They lived at that time in the divine order of life. There was no separation between the levels. The direct presence of God could flow down through all their levels of mind and directly into the physical and sensory levels of their bodies. Everything was in harmony. In the earliest heavenly sort of people, the sensory capacities of the body served the inner self obediently. And beyond that, they had no interest in those capacities. But then as the story goes, the serpent enticed Eve to pick and eat fruit they were forbidden to eat. And Eve enticed Adam. And once they had eaten that fruit, the quality of life got drastically worse. The serpent is a symbol of the physical senses. When Adam and Eve chose to listen to the serpent's instructions, instead of instructions from God. That is a symbol of the point when humanity began to be directed by their physical senses rather than by their internal perception from God. This destroyed the original harmony and order of life. And the results are what is symbolized in the story by a curse. And Jehovah God said to the snake, because you have done this, a curse on you above every beast and above every wild animal of the field. You will travel on your belly and eat dirt all the days of your life. So I'm gonna head back to the studio and talk to Curtis about what this curse means.
that's an amazing portrayal that you were describing there. I feel like it's worth mentioning, right, that um, in biblical language, God bringing a curse actually means evil bringing a curse on itself, right? Absolutely, but our earthly mentality might see it as God causing us some kind of trouble, but actually the trouble is sourced in that very evil itself. Yeah, and to talk a little more about the connection between the, the sensory level and, and evil, the secrets of heaven 249, eating dirt all the days of its life, the serpent, means that the sensory plane became incapable of living on anything but what was bodily and earthly, so that it turned hellish. It's not like it was always bad. It was meant to be a good part of the whole, but it became hellish because it cut itself off from the divine. Right, which then made it susceptible to suffering and decay and that kind of stuff. And that actually, prior to that, life was possibly very, very different. This is from Spiritual Experiences 4592. If people had lived in a state of goodness, they would decline to the end of old age. And then when the body could no longer respond to the needs of the inner person, then they would pass over from the earthly body without sickness. So it seems like things were very different before evil came onto the scene. Yeah, it seems like maybe moving to the afterlife was more like just gently shedding a layer rather than this kind of drastic ending that we now experience as death. Yeah, there's always some kind of shedding. There's always this moving on. You're never going to stay in the physical world forever, but it wasn't the kind of painful, isolating, confusing experience of death as we see it now. And I'm thinking, too, that uh, the spiritual world and the physical world were so connected that they wouldn't have the same kind of cutoff that we feel now when there's no contact with these people that have died. Right, because we don't even know for sure if there is a life after death. That it, for us it feels like this person's gone, I never see him, but then they would have more visions, more communications that would kind of ease that, right? Right, right. I feel good about where we are. Mm. Yeah, I feel like we got to see how death is part of a positive process, both physically, even for God, it was part of helping and, mm. and saving all of us, and that it's something that can spur useful things inside ourselves too. Yes, and I'm still thinking about these benefits. Yeah. What are the benefits that come to us when we go through these various kinds of death? What makes it all worth it? This is mm -hmm. Secrets of Heaven 2657. In the beginning, our first rationality recognizes no other kind of love than love for ourselves and for the material world. Mm, that's the only love. Despite mm. hearing that heavenly love is completely different, we do not grasp it. Like, nah, that's for goody goodies. Whatever good we do after that, the only pleasure we find in it that we seem to have earned another person's gratitude, or that people view us as Christian, which was high praise. Get and, points. And, yeah, that's right. Or that we are securing the joy of eternal life by our deeds. Get something in the future, yeah. Our second rationality, on the other hand, which we receive from the Lord through regeneration, through this process we've been talking about, starts to sense something pleasant in goodness itself and truth itself. Wow. We feel this pleasure not on any account of our own, but on account of what is good and true. When this delight carries us away, we reject any credit for it, to the point where we spurn such an idea as an outrage. This pleasure keeps growing and growing in us and becomes bliss and happiness in the other life and our very heaven. Mm. Sounds like it takes a while, but it's absolutely transformative in the long run. Yeah, and it all goes from thinking that we're the point of the whole world to you know, good, doing something good is what it's all about. And That's what it seems like about. we really get some benefits. So thanks so much for talking this through with me today. Thanks for having me along. Don't forget what it's all for. Don't forget that through all this struggle and rebirth and yes, death, we're making heaven. The leaving behind one phase and the beginning of another that we call death is present on all levels of life. In cells, in species, in our lives, and in the growth of our spirits, death is, as strange as it seems, a crucial step forward. Now, I'm not trying to say that death isn't painful. Losing anything we care about hurts, and losing someone that we love is probably the worst thing that you can go through. And death isn't supposed to be this brutal. This wasn't the original divine design. But the important thing to remember is that life does have a design. Even though the journey can be really rough, the machine works. And it's actually the best way that we can be led through life, given the totality of the circumstances. And if you think about the quilt that comes out of it, this interconnected community of souls that are always getting closer and always getting happier forever, I mean, that is cool. Yep, thanks. Enjoy your machine. What was up with that guy? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I guess he just really enjoys sewing or something. 